In early 2020, many governments around the world began implementing stimulus packages to fight the global proliferation of a certain illness. An illness whose name I can't say without being penalized by the YouTube algorithm. Anyway, governments are throwing around metric crap tons of money to fight the you-know-what, leading some people to ask, isn't this going to cause high inflation or hyperinflation? In case you forgot, inflation refers to a sustained increase in the price of everything that you can buy, for any reason. Imagine your food, your rent, or your gigolo doubling in price, and you can see why high inflation is generally considered a bad thing. In this video, I'll illustrate the numbers, and you can decide for yourself whether runaway inflation is likely to happen. In March and early April of 2020, the U.S. government took several unprecedented steps to combat the disease that must not be named by throwing unprecedented amounts of economic stimulus money at the problem. To get an idea of the ginormous girth stuffed into these stimulus packages, consider that the smallest stimulus is already a whopping $8.3 billion. That amount of money could hypothetically buy enough Honda Accords to form a line of cars 1,000 miles long. That's a line of cars stretching from Las Vegas to Dallas, or from Dublin to Vienna. $8.3 billion seems like a lot of money, until you compare it to the $2.1 trillion provided by the CARES Act. $2.1 trillion could hypothetically buy enough Honda Accords to form a line of cars that wraps around the Earth 11 times. So, how can the U.S. government pay trillions of dollars for the CARES Act and other economic stimulus packages? Well, it could start by collecting taxes and fees from people and corporations. Ha, <laughs> I'm just kidding. The U.S. government can't make enough money to fund the CARES Act. In 2019, the federal government collected $3.5 trillion in revenue, but it also spent about a trillion dollars more than it earned. So it'll have to spend other people's money too. And by that, I mean the government will borrow trillions of dollars to fight the you-know-what and then pay back the money with interest. And if it can't find enough of other people's money to spend, it can simply create more money out of thin air to throw out the problem. But borrowing and creating money usually results in inflation. If the amount of money in the economy increases, but the amount of stuff that you can buy with that money stays the same, then the price of that stuff tends to compensate by becoming more expensive. Confused? Think of it this way. Imagine that the US government waved a magic wand and doubled the amount of money that everyone has. Would that make everyone twice as rich? Sadly, no. Although everyone now has twice as many dollars as before, there's twice as many dollars competing to buy the same limited pool of goods and services, so that each dollar only has half as much buying power as before. Your local baker will double the price for his bread, and your local gigolo would double the price for his services, at least in theory. I say in theory because the real world is not that simple. For starters, there are multiple ways to define money. If you consider only the physical currency in circulation, which is about $1.9 trillion, then the $2.1 trillion from the CARES Act would seemingly double the money in circulation. That would cause massive inflation. Fortunately, dollar bills and coins only make up a tiny fraction of the overall money supply. The electronic money in checking and savings accounts, certificates of deposit, and more exotic financial instruments like commercial paper or treasury bills are also part of the money supply. Let's look at a different definition of money known as the money zero maturity, or MZM, which has historically been the best predictor of inflation. By this definition of money, there's almost $19 trillion floating around. If the CARES Act throws in an additional $2.1 trillion, you might increase the money supply by about 11%. That's not enough to summon the economic demon known as hyperinflation. Another reason I said, in theory, is because the real-world bakers and gigolos don't usually think about the MZM money supply when they set prices for their bread and escort services. Instead, they respond to supply and demand. Recently, demand for certain goods and services has fallen off a cliff because we're all locked indoors, and many companies have responded by decreasing prices to entice people back out to spend money. Meanwhile, the world supply of petroleum has gone way up, which has lowered prices because producers are competing to sell to fewer buyers. When oil prices fall, it's not just the price of gasoline or diesel that falls with it. Food and other physical products also fall in price because they become cheaper to manufacture and transport. So on one hand, you have low demand for most goods and services, and a high supply of oil. Together, these two have already suppressed prices and resulted in deflation, the opposite of inflation. 
On the other hand, as the CARES Act kicks in, there will be tons of money added to the existing supply, which will boost inflation. From here, it's a balancing act between deflation and inflation. If we develop a vaccine or cure for the unnameable contagion, demand will increase, and so will prices, which favors inflation. But if too many people lose their jobs and we reach the tipping point I talked about in my previous video, demand will fall further than it already has, and prices will fall even more, which favors deflation. If oil suppliers stop drilling and the supply of oil falls, prices will rise and favor inflation. But if they keep drilling, oil prices will keep falling, favoring deflation. Let's turn our attention from the CARES Act to the U.S. Federal Reserve. Not only has the Federal Reserve committed to loaning out $2.3 trillion directly to damsels in distress, it has also expanded an economic stimulus program known as quantitative easing. I won't bore you with the details, so let's just say that quantitative easing essentially floods the economy with freshly created money and encourages banks to provide cheap, low-interest loans to people and businesses. The Federal Reserve initially set an upper limit of $700 billion on their quantitative easing program, but they later abolished that ceiling before a month had passed. If you look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and the MZM money supply, you can see a sharp uptick starting around February of 2020. Quantitative easing has already begun and the money supply is already expanding. There's no upper limit to the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing program, so no one knows how high these graphs will go. On one hand, if something really big happens on the left side of the scale, we could enter a deflationary death spiral and crash into the economic hell of a second Great Depression. On the other hand, if we continue printing money like the Weimar Republic, we will grotesquely expand the money supply, devalue our dollars into oblivion, and summon the hyperinflation demon into our midst. I'll leave it up to you to decide which scenario is more likely. But if you wanted my opinion, I'd say that there are too many unknowns to know one way or another. Our global economy is so intricately connected that a minor decision made in one obscure corner of the world can initiate a chain reaction of events that can have explosive impacts on the system as a whole. Any economic forecast that I can make will have the same predictive power as a coin flip 